Hey there, CNC or Scott here again for CNC Labs. Welcome to a super windy episode of Cottage Country CNC. In this episode, we are going to cut metal. out there a little while ago asking you, the audience, what you'd like to see out of a tutorial video, and the resounding winner was decorative wall art. So uh, we're going to show you how to trace an image in Inkscape, what bits we used, the feeds and the speeds, and why we used them, and all the things, and uh, let's get rocking. All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty of the tutorial, let's take a minute to talk about safety. We probably should do this with more videos, but um, we're milling metal this time. It's a little bit different. Most of us are probably used to milling wood, carving wood. So with metal, there might be just a few new considerations. So we're just gonna highlight a couple of them. One, there's gonna be metal shards flying everywhere. So make sure you have your safety glasses on. I would also recommend having your dust collector shoe on, maybe not connected to your dust collector, but your dust collector shoe on just to minimize the amount of stuff that's flying out. I actually put a piece of tape around the bottom of my dust shoe just to keep it from flying out even further. It worked really well. Unfortunately, I don't have a dust collector up here and I forgot to bring my dust shoe. So in all the carving videos that we're gonna see for this project, I was not being as safe as I could be. So there's that, which leads to number two. You may wanna consider using a different dust collector if you're going to use dust collection for this one. Hot metal bits plus sawdust could equal fire and that would be bad for everybody. So maybe use a different, sh uh, like a shop vac or if nothing else, have some wet media in there, a wet rag or something, just to make sure, and make sure you're keeping an eye on it. Nobody wants a fire in their shop. It's it's terrifying. Number three, I basically didn't have any issues when I did my carvings. I, I, I think I maybe got poked once, but we're cutting metal, so there could be sharp edges. So just, you know, pay extra attention when you're lifting and moving and sliding. Um, shockingly, I didn't get hurt, but, you know, it's a little bit different than wood. And four, if you do decide to get a little bit crazy and try some experimental finishes on your metal, uh, just be very aware of the substances that you may be mixing together. There are certain combinations that can create some pretty nasty gases and things like that. So do your research, make sure you know what you're doing or at least have a very good idea and don't just start mix, you know, mixing random things together. And even when you are confident, make sure you have a respirator on, make sure you have eye protection and make sure you have your gloves because this is supposed to be about fun, but you gotta be safe too. So there's my public service announcement. Alrighty, here we are in Inkscape. Uh, we're not gonna go through this, like through every option in the program. We'll probably do basics for beginners on that later on. If you guys wanna see it, let us know in the comments and that'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. For this, we're just going to trace an image really quick and really dirty and save out the SVG so that you can bring the vectors into vCarve. You can trace the bitmap in vCarve, but we figured we'd show you Inkscape because it's free software and who doesn't like free? So simply put, we're going to open our selected image that you've chosen. In this case, for me, it's this lovely looking, big leafy looking guy. Uh, you select your image, you come up here to path, you go over here to trace bitmap. In here, this is quite honestly experimentation 101. So I did mess around with the settings and I quite honestly found that the defaults were pretty good for me. The only thing I think I changed was having invert image on just because I, that's the way my brain works. I liked it better. Other than that, everything was stock and then you can just hit apply. You're gonna see a ton of verts there. It looks a little bit scary, but if you come over here into your image or your layers, you can turn off your image. And then if you click off, you'll start to see that, hey, look at that. It did a pretty sweet job of tracing that, if I'm being totally honest. I was a little surprised when I was tinkering with this, but it, it's pretty clean, it's pretty nice. So that's about as good as you can get. If you wanna mess around in Inkscape with the verts and all of that stuff, the paths, you are welcome to. I prefer to do it in the software where the final product's gonna come out of. So for me, even if I traced it in Inkscape or Illustrator, I would still almost always do my tinkering in vCarve in this case, because you don't know how, you know, verts are gonna join up. You don't know how segments are gonna come in. I'd rather do it where the final product is gonna be made out of. So you're going to save as, and then you'll see that it says Inkscape SVG. It's just as good as a plain SVG. They all work, it's all fine. As long as it's an SVG, it's vector format. There's mine saved. Everybody is happy, Inkscape is done. Now we're gonna bounce over into vCarve and we're gonna import those vectors that we just exported from Inkscape. 
This is my working file that I've already created, that I've already worked from. I had some reminders in here and all the things. Mine are, the, it imports vertically, but my wasteboard here is horizontal. It's, it's this format, so that's why it's rotated. There's nothing different. Uh, the files that you guys are gonna get are gonna be lovely and you know you can tinker to your heart's content. We're gonna start from scratch because this is really fairly simple stuff. So you're gonna create your new file. That's going to be whatever your dimensions are that you are working with. In my case, 1824 and 0 0.015 inches. I'm gonna hit okay. I'm going to go import vectors. There is my SVG that I just saved from Inkscape. I'm gonna hit open. Obviously the scaling is off, so you can scale it right now if you want to, or you can do it later. For giggles, we'll just do it right now because it doesn't really matter. There we go, so that's close enough. I'm leaving a little bit of a border all the way around just to make sure that that metal's got something to hold on to. If you have everything selected and hit F9, it will center it on your document for you. If I'm creating the vectors or if I've downloaded them or somebody's given them to me, I almost always do these couple of things once they're imported. I will join the open vectors. In this case, Inkscape did a fantastic job tracing and there are no, there's no open vectors, which is lovely. So you don't even have to hit join because there's nothing to open, there's nothing to join. The next thing I will do is typically play with the fit to curves. Now. If you go into edit node mode, you'll see it looks crazy, but it's actually not that bad. If you look at it, they're, they're fairly clean. Yes, there's a lot of verts, but there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of squiggly lines. So there needs to be a fair amount of verts. However, let's say you imported something and there was just a million verts, like just crazy, crazy amounts. You can go to that fit to curve. You can change your type if you like. I prefer Bezier curves just because I'm an illustrator guy and that's where I come from. Your tolerance, the bigger the number, the more it'll mess with stuff. So I'll show you really quickly what happens. If you go to like 0.05, we'll zoom in a little bit and see how nice this all looks like leaves and veins. And if you hit preview, it's gonna go all blobby. It still looks like leaves and veins, but it's more blobby looking. It's not as nice. If you make that tolerance lower, so it's tighter, it'll bring your detail back. Ta-da! From playing with this, I know that the fit to curves doesn't actually really benefit me because the geometry, the vectors were very clean when I came in, so I'm not actually going to do that, but it is something I typically do. Something else that can come in very handy, just from a selection standpoint, if you really want to, is uh, grouping or using your layers. In this particular case, because I know that I'm going to have a tool path for the outside and a tool path for all the inside stuff, I don't need to. There's nothing crazy going on in this file, but layer management and groups can come in super handy. As far as this actual project goes, all I did beyond what I've just done was offset this outside edge that looked a little skinny to me coming around here, this border. So I just went to my offset. I did outwards 0.1 inches, kaboom. And you could delete the original one if you want to. I typically don't because I'm paranoid, <laughs> but I did afterwards. So now I've got a little bit thicker of a border all the way around because that metal is pretty thin stuff. Um, so I just wanted to have a little bit of structure around it. And then if I bounce back to my original version, you'll see that I kind of wanted them to look individual. I knew I was going to cut two of these out and I wanted them to look unique from each other. They're leaves, they're not the same, right? So I, I purposely went in and added some natural defects to them right here and you know, cut some areas out. Um, and I made them different for each one. This one, this leaf got squished and squashed a little bit and then rotated so that they are somewhat individual looking. Other than that, that's all I did to get my vectors ready to go. So after I added a little bit of personality to each of the leaves, then it was time to talk tool paths. For both the inside and the outside, it was just a profile tool path, nothing special. However, that leads to the part that maybe a lot of you are here for, and that is to learn about the bits we use, the feeds and the speeds, and why. So you can see here that I used a single flute eighth inch upcut bit. And through research, checking out the forums, and my own experience, the important part to remember here is that heat kills bits. Single flute upcuts are meant to evacuate the carved material really quickly, keeping the temperatures down. That is why I went with them. Um, there are other people who have other experiences and, you know, I don't have a ton of experience. This is just from the fairly limited from this project, but my experience was single flute upcuts work wonderfully. They cut smooth and they get everything out of there. Good to go. The next thing to talk about is our feeds and our speeds. When we are cutting in metal, it is going to be lower and slower than you are used to cutting in wood. So let's pop this open and you'll see that there's my inside one, there's my single flute upcut. And if I go into my settings over here, you're going to see that those feeds and those speeds are way lower than what you would typically see in wood most would. I found anything from 0 0.03 to 0 0.015 for a depth of cut. That's inches at I think that's 76 mil to 38 mil worked really well. And anything from 20 inches per minute to 40, which is approximately 750 millimeters to 1000 millimeters uh, per minute gave really good results. 
The temperature stayed low, there was no binding, all the chips were evacuated, the cuts didn't have any peeling on the edges, and everything just worked really nicely. You can choose to add some lubricant in there if you want to, not totally necessary, but again, I'm not a metallurgist, I'm not an expert, I don't know all the things. Take it with a grain of salt, uh, the experts out there will probably chime in and have something to say, and I'm happy to learn from them too. And last but certainly not least, I'm going to talk about uh, the materials that I was experimenting with. Different metals have different hardnesses and different compositions, and those are factors when you are cutting. Aluminum, brass, and copper are all relatively soft metals and they will mill fairly nicely. Steel is a different hardness, so you're gonna have to change your settings a little bit. What I experimented with was 22 and 26 gauge aluminum and steel, and the thicker aluminum and the thinner steel carved like butter with the settings that are in my files that we're gonna share with you guys. The thicker steel, the 22 gauge steel, was not quite as happy, but I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't spend a ton of time experimenting on the thicker steel because I got the results I needed with the thinner steel. Another handy thing I learned while doing all of this was how important it is to have a flat and a smooth wasteboard. So if there's any cuts or gouges out of your wasteboard from other projects or anything else, the metal can actually bend when the bit goes over it because it's so thin. Um, so having it as smooth and flat as possible is really important. In the same vein, having it properly surfaced is also really important. My table is likely not perfect because it moves every time I come and go. It was out by 0 0.044 millimeters from left to right, and you can see me stop and start the job probably a dozen times to mess with my Z height uh, to make sure it punched all the way through. Just pay attention for that one if you are going to start carving thin metal. So after you have your bit selected and your tool paths and your settings all dialed in, you're just going to save your tool paths like we always do. You're going to load it up in G Center and you are going to start carving metal, and you're going to find out how relatively easy it is and how much fun it is. So. Uh, we're going to go to the Littlest Workshop now and we're going to show you how much fun we actually had carving up this project. Let's go! A couple hours in the sunshine gives this guy a pretty rock and resting look if that's what you're looking for. I am. You can see how easy, incredibly easy it is to get this look. That's the part that I love. And that was the whole reason I needed steel, not aluminum, because you can't rust aluminum. have it folks, super cool metal wall art cut out on your long mill. The design options are endless, the final results are stunning, and it's really not as scary as you think it is, so give it a try. Having said that, this is going to be the last episode of Cottage Country CNC for this year, so we hope you enjoyed the scenery and we hope you, you know, we inspired you to try something new. As always, Thank you for watching. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in and hang out with us. We hope you find it helpful and handy. And if you do, please make sure you're liked and subscribed so you don't miss out on any of the wonderful content that we're creating. And uh, until next year from Cottage Country, we'll see you around the CNC. How's your paddle?